Hi, I'm Pastor John Anderson, and this is A Little Book Open. The little book, of course, being the book of Daniel. I hope you've been following along with us in the different episodes as we've been going through the chapters of Daniel one by one. And now we find ourselves in chapter 10. Chapter 10 being the introductory to the uh, last vision, the fourth vision in the book of Daniel. So as we begin our study today, we want to pause for a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into the material. Father in heaven, again, we want to thank you for giving us this wonderful book, a book which is now open to our view, to our study, to our understanding. And as we study today, Lord, we pray that you will open our minds so that we can discern your purpose and your plan and your love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So in our last segment, we were talking about how God is involved in history, in Bible times, in modern times, and we might take a short look backward in history to see how that is uh, certainly evident through some of the major uh, events of history. 1588, the Spanish Armada, uh, under the uh, inspiration of the papal authority, was coming against England to put down Protestantism. And yet, history records how that mighty fleet, the greatest navy of its time, met its end, a violent storm, uh, and it crashed upon the rocks and, and was destroyed. Had that not happened, history would have been different. There would have likely been no Protestant Reformation to take place in England. We can think of many other incidences where we detect the hand of God operating in history. What about the founding of America? Here's a group of, of pilgrims, a uh, little more than 100, coming to a country, and they, they land in the, uh, the end of the year. The winter is very harsh, wiping out 50 of their, of their numbers, leaving them only half. And yet, by the providence of God and the hospitality of the ones who met them there, the the ones from Native America, uh, that, that grew and became to be what we know now as the, the United States. A country without a king, a church without a pope. Religious freedom, and God blessed this nation like none other, we can say. And one of the leaders, of course, was George Washington. And we're told that uh, in the times prior to the American Revolution, there was a war, the French and Indian War, we call it. And during that time, Washington would be on his horse leading the troops to battle. And the Indian warfares would be firing their bullets at him. And yet nothing seemed to happen. He didn't die. He didn't fall off his horse. Finally, the chief told his braves, don't waste your bullets on that man. He must be, he must be guarded by the divine. And as Washington got off his horse when the battle was finished and took his coat off, it was riddled with bullet holes and yet not one touched his body. God protected him. God was involved in the founding of this country. Now, it was very clear when this country was founded that, that religion was recognized as being a very important component. The idea was not to have a state-sponsored church, but the idea was not to divorce religion from the people, even from the public square. But nevertheless, sadly, through, through the passages of time, uh, sentiments concepts have changed with regard to that. Napoleon aspired to bring all of Europe under his control. Now, when he was about to do that, someone shared with him the content of Daniel chapter 2, the statue dream. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome divided Europe, the feet of iron and clay that would not adhere one to another. And when Napoleon was told that, he scoffed at it and went about his business. But his purpose was to be thwarted. Waterloo came. And through circumstances that historians don't even today quite understand, his efforts came to naught. And he was defeated. And when he was defeated, it is reported that, that he said something to the effect that God is too much for me. Napoleon was defeated in his attempt to unite Europe. So was Hitler. Hitler wanted to do the very same thing. And at different times of that war, World War II, it looked like Hitler was going to succeed in his efforts. We recall a time when it looked like the Allied troops were trapped and escape was going to be impossible. And yet something that historians now call the miracle of Dunkirk, in which there was a flotilla of private boats that came over and took uh, the Allied troops back to safety across the channel. Uh, still again, how did that happen? We recognize it today. It was divine providence that led 
in that rescue. So <clears throat> scientists today, through fingerprints, through DNA, through GPS, can tell when somebody was there, even though there may not be an eyewitness to report that account. And in the same way, when we look through history, both on the big scale and on our individual scale, we can see the fingerprint of God. We know that God was there, unseen, but he was there and involved in our lives and in the lives of, of nations. What a beautiful thought that is. Again, fitting perfectly into the four themes that we've been thinking about revealed in the book of Daniel. God knows, God cares, God is involved, and God wins. Coming through beautifully in chapter 10. So we're going to give a little thought now to something that uh, is a matter of curiosity uh, for a lot of people. And the question is, who is Michael? Now, the name Michael appears in the Old Testament a number of times applied to ordinary people. But it is uh, certain that on, in some contexts, the name Michael applies to somebody that is supernatural. And so people wonder, who is Michael? Is he cre a created being? Is he an angel? Is he an archangel? Who is Michael? So let's spend a few minutes to look and see what the Bible says about that. First, we're going to look at Daniel chapter 10 and verse 13. Daniel 10 verse 13 says, The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Remember, that was the ex exact length of time that Daniel was in his Daniel fast, his morning, praying for the success of God's purpose. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Recall again the background that the edict had been given by Cyrus for the Israelites to be able to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. The 70 years had been completed, and now Cyrus, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you can read his decree there in Ezra chapter 1, he uh, tells the people to go back, he even sponsors them with his own money for that purpose. They go back and they begin the rebuilding per program. While they're doing that, neighbors from the north, from Samaria, come down and say, we would like to help you do that. Let us join with you in this effort. But under divine guidance, the Lord inspires his people to, to decline that offer. Why? Because the Lord knew that the seeds of idolatry were deeply embedded in the men's hearts and that if they joined in that, they would bring in pagan ideas. The whole purpose of Israel going back was to preserve true worship of the creator God, not the reestablishment of idolatry that had plagued Israel through the centuries. And so they said, no, thank you. We'll do this on our own. And of course, from that, they smarted, they resented it, and they said, we'll do everything we can to thwart that purpose. So the devil had a two-pronged attack in mind, which is often the way that he goes about his strategy. Number one, of course, involve the Samaritan people there, have them integrate false ideas about God, and that would lead to open idolatry later, the worship of idols of, of uh, wood and stone. That would be the first purpose. If that did not happen, if they said no, which they did, they said no, then he would cause their generous offer to be turned into an effort of, of frustration and rebellion. And so that's what happened. When the Jewish people said, no, thank you, then the, the Samaritans went about a purpose to try to uh, slow down and hinder, even bring to a halt, the purpose of the Jews to rebuild. What did they do? Well, they wrote letters to the king of Persia. And they said, you don't want to help these people out. Why, they are a rebellious people. Look back in history. That was the very reason why Nebuchadnezzar took them captive and destroyed their city, because they were a rebellious people. If you sponsor them to go back, the same thing's going to happen to you. You don't want that to happen. So st stop this, put a stop to this rebuilding uh, that's going on right now. And the king listened to them, and the building slowed down and stopped. That's the context of Daniel chapter 10. It's in this period when things aren't happening. That's why Daniel is so concerned, as he was back in uh, chapter 8, as we read about. His utmost uh, theme was the, the progression of God's kingdom and the honor of his name. And it didn't look like it was happening. So that's what's happening here. And Gabriel is saying that I've been working on, on the mind of the king of Persia to try to work through this problem so that the attempt by Satan through the Samaritans to bring this building pro project to a halt will be undone, will be corrected. 
And in that context, he says, during that episode, it says, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. So there's the name Michael. Who is Michael? Well, we get a little more information in the last verse of chapter 10. Chapter 10 of Daniel, verse 21. Gabriel says, I will tell you the truth, what is noted in the scripture of truth. And then in parentheses, as it's printed in my Bible, no one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. So what is he saying here? What he's saying is that no one is above me except Michael. Now, we are led to believe that Gabriel was one of God's top angels. He was the one that came to visit Mary at the time that Jesus was born. He is uh, an archangel, a, a chief angel. And yet he's saying that there is someone that is above him, and his name is Michael. So that gives us something to think about when we try to identify from the Bible, who is Michael? But there's more. We're told that Michael is one of the chief princes in verse 13. And then in verse 21, it also says, Michael, your prince. Now, the word prince there in Hebrew, we've come upon it before. We studied it uh, way back in our early sessions. It's the Hebrew term Tsar. And this term means ruler or prince or commander. And uh, uh, it is used throughout the Old Testament to identify different ones that occupied positions of authority. Now, later in history, this same word was used uh, by different cultures, different countries. It became the Caesars of Rome. It became the Kaisers of Germany, the Tsars of Russia, and so on. And even today, when someone is put into a position of, of authority, uh, having jurisdiction over a, a certain segment of government, let's say the economy, that person might be called the economic czar or something like that. So the word czar has deep roots going all the way back to Old Testament times. And in this case, it's applied to this person, Michael. Who is Michael? Well, he's a prince or a czar. Now, using that same term, go back to Joshua chapter 5, and we find something else very interesting here about that term czar. Joshua chapter 5 pictures the Israelites. They're ready to come into Canaan and conquer the cities according to God's command. And Joshua as they're preparing to do battle against Jericho, a well-fortified, uh, idolatrous city there, he's contemplating and in prayer, and then someone comes up to him. We're in Joshua chapter 5. Uh, we're looking at verse 13 there. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood up opposite him with his sword drawn at his, in his hand. Joshua went to him and said, are you for us or for our adversaries? He said, no, but as commander of the army. The word commander is this word czar. No, but as commander or czar of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Notice Joshua's reaction to this. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped. And he said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander, or czar, of the Lord's army said, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. So, who is the being that meets with Joshua? The one whom Joshua falls on his face and worships? The one who uh, commands him to take his sandal off because the ground is holy? What does that remind you of? Well, that's the story of Exodus chapter 3. When God was revealed in the burning bush and Moses was told to take his sandal off and he, he worshiped the Lord there. So the commander or czar of Joshua chapter 5 is a, a supernatural being. It is a divine being. Michael, your prince. Now, we noted there in chapter 10 and verse 13, it has a, a way of expressing that that might bring a question to your mind. Let's go back to verse 13. Gabriel says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Behold, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me. So it may be that in somebody's mind, that form of expression, one of the chief princes, might put uh, Michael in a stature that is not uh, divine. One, he's just one among many, you might think. What we need to see is that in the Hebrew language, and it's important to learn as much as we can about how how thoughts are communicated through words in different languages. 
In the Hebrew language, uh, the word one can be used to express uh, what we call the ordinal as well as the cardinal form. What do we mean by that? If you're unfamiliar with those terms or haven't used them for a while. Well, in the English language, when we talk about something that is of a single nature, we can use a word that is called the ordinal form of it, which is first. First, second, third, or so on. Those are words that express uh, numbers in, in, in that way. But we could also use them in a cardinal way, which is one, two, three, four. We have a different set of words to describe first, second, third as against one, two, three. In the Hebrew language, that difference does not exist. It's just one word, and it's up to the translators to decide whether it should be in the ordinal form first or in the cardinal form one. Now, in this case, the translators chose to use the ordinal form, and they just said, Michael, one of your princes. But if we choose to use the other one, which is perfectly legitimate, according to the grammar of Hebrew, it would come out that it would be that Michael is first among the chief princes. I think that makes a whole lot more sense. Now, as an aside, when we think about the numbers used in the Hebrew language, when we Go back to the first chapter of Genesis. Again, we have numbers there that are uh, uh, used to describe the different days of activity. And the, the translators are in, uh, consistently using the ordinal form. They say the first day, the second day. They could have just as easily said day one, day two, but they chose to use the ordinal one. So we're going to suggest that it makes more sense if we think of Michael as being first among the chief princes. Now that would put Jesus in the proper stature that he belongs as being a divine being. Now, Young's literal translation of the Bible reflects that concept. The way he translates it, he says, Michael, the first of the chief princes, came to help me. So different translations of the Bible are going to have it read one way or the other, but just recognize that it is certainly legitimate to think of Michael as being first among the chief princes. What else can we learn about Michael from the Bible? Well, we find that in the ninth verse of the very short book of Jude, Michael is mentioned again. And it's in the context of the resurrection of the body of Moses. Now, remember that Moses was the, the one who brought Israel out of Egypt on the way to the Canaan land, but he made a mistake toward the very end of that journey by smiting the rock twice rather than as God commanded him to speak to it. And for that reason, Moses was told, you'll be able to see the land, go up to the top of Mount Nebo and, and look the land over, but you'll not actually be the one to lead them in physically. That, that uh, privilege came upon his successor, Joshua. So Moses died. The Bible tells us he was buried. The Lord buried him. and No one knows where his grave is. It uh, concludes the last part of the book of Deuteronomy. But we also know that Moses came back to life, don't we? because we're told about the Mount of Transfiguration experience when the Lord appeared with Elijah, who the Bible describes as one that was translated to heaven without seeing death by the whirlwind, the chariot of fire in 2 Kings there. And also with him is Moses. How could Moses be there if he had died unless it was that he was brought back to life? Well, Jude 9 is a little bit of a window for us to understand how that happened. And it sheds light also on the verse in Romans chapter 5 when it talks about how death reigned from Adam to Moses. Now, Enoch had been taken to heaven already, but he had never seen death. But Moses died, and he was resurrected. He was the first, chronologically, to be brought from the clutches of death and be given the gift of immortality. So at that scene, who do you suppose would be there to obstruct and to uh, try to hinder that process. It would be the devil, of course. So if you read in Jude chapter 9, you'll find that there was a dispute that took place regarding the body of Moses. And I suspect that uh, the devil was there to say, how can you do this? You don't have the right to bring him back to life. The atonement for his sins has not actually taken place yet. You, you cannot do this. But in the ninth verse of the book of Jude, Michael just says, the Lord rebuke. The Lord rebuke. He was not going to enter into a conversation with the devil. He was going to do what he was going to do. And he had the power to do that. So who has the power to bring life 
to the dead. That, of course, is Jesus Christ. He called himself the resurrection and the life. We find in Revelation chapter 12 that the war that broke out in heaven was a war that involved Michael and his angels. And we can think of the word his in the possessive form there. Angels that belong to or answered to or were part of the army of Michael. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon or the devil and his angels. So putting all these things together, it certainly makes sense that Michael is simply a Bible code name to talk about Jesus. He is the one who brings life to the dead. He is the one who champions God's cause against the forces of evil. And he is the one who is above Gabriel, who was going to give help to rescind that discouraging letter that had been formulated by the Samaritans to stop the rebuilding process. When we take a look at the word Michael itself, it has an interesting background. It has interesting components. Taken literally, the name Michael means the one who is like God. Michael. You see El at the end, which is the shortened, the abbreviated form of the name of Elohim, God. And the earlier part of it is, has to do with like or similar. The one who is like God. Now, remember that in the uh, Hebrew manuscripts, the Greek manuscripts as well, there was no punctuation. So is that to be thought of in the declarative sentence, the one who is like God? Or is it to be thought of in the uh, interrogative sense as a question, who is like God? Well, in this case, uh, we can say both are perfectly applicable. Jesus is the one who is like God. The name Michael expresses that in a very beautiful way. Now, we are to become like God, of course, in character, but only Jesus, the Bible describes in the book of Hebrews, as being in the express image of God. And you remember when Jesus conversed with the disciples at the end of his journey here, he said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So Jesus is in the express image of God. He is the one who is like God. He is Michael, as you understand the meaning of that name uh, being fulfilled in a beautiful way. In the same way, the, the uh, name Michael can be thought of as a question mark. Who is like God? Because as you go back in the book of Isaiah chapter 14, you'll remember that the devil aspired to be the one like God. I will exalt my throne, and so on, he said, in a very blasphemous way. So we can think of the name of Michael as being an answer to Satan's uh, uh, aspirations. The devil thought he was going to be like God, but he only wanted to be like God in power, not in character. That was his big mistake. We are all uh, instructed and counseled to be like God in character, but we cannot be like God in power because there is only one creator, one Godhead, who is the sovereign of the universe, the one who speaks and planets come to be. We'll not be him like him in that sense, but we can be like God in character. But the name Michael is both a declarative sentence, the one who is like God, and it's also a question uh, addressed at Satan. Who is like God? Because Satan certainly is not like God, either in power or in character, but Michael is. The Bible says that in John 1, 18, that the purpose of Jesus was to come to declare him, to make God known. And that purpose was uh, certainly fulfilled as he revealed the character of God through his, through his life and his ministry and even up to the point of his death. Being willing to give his life on Calvary's cross in a gift that uh, is beyond description. So we're going to turn our attention as we close our session today just to introduce some thoughts pertaining to the 11th chapter of Daniel. And as we do so, uh, we will invite you to tune in in the next session where we'll go into it deeper. But just to lay the fabric a little bit, the framework a little bit, let's give consideration to what we see in the 11th chapter of Daniel, a chapter that has been studied and discussed for a long, long time. We're going to start by laying out two basic propositions that will help us in our understanding. Proposition number one is that this is the fourth in a series of outline prophecies that tell the history of the world from the point when the prophet receives the vision 
all the way down to the grand climax when Jesus returns in glory. We see that in chapter 2, the statue dream from Babylon all the way down to the feet of iron and clay. The stone that's cut out without hands and spites the image and becomes God's kingdom. Chapter 7, that's the vision of the wild animals. Again, the same basic uh, story, but given in different symbols. Chapter 8, again, same basic content, but given through different images, different symbols. But it's the story of human history as God is involved working out his, uh, working out his purpose from the time at which the prophet receives the vision down to the grand, grand climax. So we're going to expect that chapter 11 of Daniel and going on into chapter 12, for, as a matter of fact, is going to be doing the same things. Now, when you put a puzzle together, a jigsaw puzzle, where do you begin? How do you start? Well, you start with those pieces that are the easiest to find and to define, the edge pieces, the corner pieces, and so on. You work from the outside in, and you fill it in piece by piece that way. Well, we're going to take that same approach as we study uh, the vision of chapter 11 and 12. We're going to start with those pieces that are most obvious, that are clearest and unambiguous, and then there'll be some parts that won't be quite as clear, but overall the basic picture will become very clear. And the picture is, of course, that God wins. Though man disposes, man proposes, God disposes. And that's the message of all the visions of Daniel and especially the vision of chapter 11. That's proposition number one. It falls into the patterns in parallel with the other three that have taken place already. The second theme that we're going to introduce just briefly is that sometimes in prophetic narratives, you may be introduced to a certain entity in the first part of that vision, and that may change as you get through the vision to the end. And next time we'll pick this up uh, and study a little bit more, but we're going to see that in Isaiah chapter 14. It begins by focusing on the king of Babylon, but then it transitions to Lucifer. And in Ezekiel 28, likewise, it begins by the discussion of the king of Tyre, but then in a very seamless, uninterrupted way, it ends up talking about Satan. So with that concept in mind, as we look at Daniel chapter 11, we're going to see certain terms that they are the same terms at the beginning and at the end, but they may apply to different persons and different entities. So if we're aware of those two main propositions as we study Daniel 11, it will keep us on track. It's in parallel with the other visions going from now to the end. And sometimes within those visions, the names and titles may be the same, but they may apply to different entities. Please plan to join us as we continue our study in the wonderful book of Daniel, the little book open. May God be with you.